Luke chapter 19, verses 41 to 44. I'll read these verses responsibly. Uh, I'll read 41, and you with me read 42, and uh, I'll do the following that pattern down to verse 44. The Bible says, And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Father, thank you, Lord, for uh, allowing us to study your word tonight. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us back together, assembling us like this. And Lord, I just thank you, Lord, that... Uh, uh, We've had a chance to be together as, as we've sung some congregational songs together. We've uh, prayed together. We've uh, heard uh, the choir sing and, and the young ladies sing for us tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the fellowship we've enjoyed. And now as we come to the, to the, to the study of the Word of God, I pray that, Father, you would certainly uh, teach us great things out of your Word. We need to hear from heaven tonight. And so, Lord, as we examine this great day of Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem before uh, he went to the cross for our sins, we I just ask you to help us to take in even more of this day and consider it well. And Lord, as we consider this day, may we realize the day is important because of the person of the day, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. May our minds be fixed on him, and Lord, may we follow him in a manner that is pleasing to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name, trusting that if there's anybody among us who's here tonight unsaved and without, uh, without uh, the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, that tonight would be that night when they would come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. This morning, as we took a look at this passage in the verses preceding where we've read tonight in Luke chapter 19, verse 41, we took a look, first of all, at the humility embodied by Jesus, and we made the, we made the point that, uh, uh, that humility is something that Jesus Christ uh, demonstrated, and if we are Christians, if we are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, it ought to be part and parcel of who we are as well. And I don't mean to go back and re-preach this morning's sermon, but, but again, I think it would uh, do us all well to check our pride and to uh, do what we can to eliminate our pride. Again, I didn't say, I didn't quote the verses this morning, but uh, they're still there in the Bible. Uh, the Bible says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And I'll be honest with you, I need grace. I need that un unmerited favor. I need that every day. And if I'm going to have what I need from Almighty God, then I've got to learn to check my pride. I've got to learn to reject that pride when it's found. I've got to learn to turn from that pride rather than cultivating that pride. Pride comes naturally for us. Pride is something that is inherent in the flesh. And when Paul uh, addressed his failures uh, uh, in the flesh in Romans chapter 7, he said, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Why? Because our flesh is tainted with pride. It's tainted with self. It's, it's attracted that way. It's drawn that way. And, and uh, so uh, we, uh, when we look at, at Jesus Christ, we see just the opposite. He was not proud. He was not arrogant. Uh, his coming to his people uh, was a very tender coming to his people. He, uh, the Bible talks about him not breaking a smoking flax or uh, you know, a bruising a broken reed. I mean, that's how gentle he was. Uh, if you think about that, the, the smoking flax, uh, uh, the, if you ever had a uh, uh, birthday candle on your cake. Darling, you just had a birthday, right? Did you have candles on your cake? No. You didn't have cake. What's, we got to get you a cake, amen? Somebody hurry up and bake her a cake, and let's put some candles on it, amen? My, my illustration's ruined now, Miss Darling. You should have said yes, I had plenty of candles. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I wouldn't want you to lie. But when you have a birthday cake and you have those candles on top, the, when you blow that out, if you touch that little, that little wick that's been burned, it, it crumbles up. Well, Jesus Christ is so tender, his touch would not break that, uh, uh, you know, break that part off. That's how tender he was when he came. Uh, the Bible tells us why, because in, in the Psalms, the psalmist said about Almighty God, he uh, uh, knows that our frame, remembers that our frames, but dust. He knows we're weak and frail and fragile creatures. And so when Jesus Christ came the first time, he came meek and lowly and humble for us because he knew our need. Amen. He didn't come to beat us up. And let me just say this. The harshest words that Jesus Christ spoke on earth were not toward sinners. It wasn't toward the woman taken in the act of adultery. It wasn't, uh, uh, those, it wasn't toward the publicans. It wasn't toward Zacchaeus. Uh, it, it wasn't toward Matthew who sat at the gate uh, at the receipt of customs. He did not have harsh words for those folks. But it was the religious leaders who knew better, the ones that uh, were, 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 were against him, the ones that were antagonistic toward him, the ones who were standing in his way, the ones who were criticizing and condemning him for doing what he came to do, those, the, those had the, the, the harsh words uh, given to them. They, they were the ones that he upbraided. But I'll tell you what, he didn't, he didn't pick on the sinner. Why? He came to save the sinners. 
And so that humility is something that, that as we study the Lord Jesus Christ, it ought to be something that we want to adopt, we want to incorporate in our own lives, uh, that humility, uh, again, uh, uh, that we would suffer, as Paul said, suffer ourselves to be defrauded, not worrying about how it turns out for us. Uh, can, I, can I say this as plainly as I can? God did, not, God did not send Jesus Christ to make us happy. He came to save us. He came to show us the way to be holy, but he didn't, he didn't come to make us happy. And so sometimes when uh, uh, God puts us in situations or allows us to go through trials or, or, or puts us in circumstances that, that we really don't like, uh, uh, you know, sometimes the reason we struggle in those, th- those times is because we, we allow pride to dictate or pride to, uh, uh, pride to, uh, to, 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 to gain our attention uh, and, and, and our focus, and, and it ruins uh, uh, the, the blessings that could be inherent in the, in, in the trials and in the burdens. And so, again, uh, the humility uh, uh, embodied by the Lord Jesus Christ was on display as he wrote, the back of that borrowed donkey up the hill. Uh, again, being the God of this universe, and, and uh, the Bible does say about the Lord God that uh, uh, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He owned that donkey. That donkey rightly belonged to him as owner of this universe, uh, but he didn't take it. He asked for it and, and gave instructions regarding it. So the humility embodied by Jesus Christ. We finished the sermon this morning uh, uh, talking about the, um, uh, the honor extended to the Lord Jesus Christ and about how we ought to do a, 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 a bit better at praising God than we do and a bit better of, of adoring him and expressing that. I think if there's one thing that uh, we in the Northeast have, have, have lost, that maybe the folks, our, our, our brethren in the South, uh, might have a little better of a handle on, is expressing our praise and our admiration and our adoration for the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, uh, you say, Pastor Ross, are you, and again, I said it this morning, I'm not advocating for an, uh, uh, a, a chaotic emotionalism. But I am saying if God spoke in our heart, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. There ought to be nothing wrong. And again, if we can't, if we can't praise God in this place and say amen and praise the Lord and hallelujah and, and cry out Hosanna to the son of David like they did on the streets of Jerusalem because we're embarrassed, because we're ashamed, because we're too reserved, uh, that, that's not what God's after. These folks were, were, were praising God. And, and when, the, when the Pharisees and the religious crowd said, hey, you need to tell your followers to be quiet, he said, I'll tell you right now, if these, if these were to quiet up, the stones would immediately cry out, amen. And again, I'm wondering who does more praising of God sometimes. I mean, the average Christian or the, the rocks out in our parking lot, amen. Uh, we ought to be in the, in the habit, in the, in the practice of praising God. Let me just say, it's, the words are not real difficult. Hallelujah. Amen's only four letters long. Amen, amen, or amen, however you want to say that. Uh, 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 glory to God, amen. Uh, that's right, preacher, or amen. Uh, you know, those things, that, that, that's okay. It, it, it's fine in here. I remember the day that I got a scathing letter. Wow, it was years and years and years ago. And just, just, just got shredded. Uh, you know, uh, I, you know, I don't know why you let people in your church say amen and why you let people speak out like that. It's very distracting and it's very unbiblical. And I wrote a nice letter back, about three pages long, and I uh, did a Bible study, which I'm sure was not appreciated. But I did a Bible study on the word "Amen" and what's, what it meant. And I, I went back into Nehemiah when the Word of God was read during the whole day. People stood up and said "Amen." I said, "Just following biblical biblical patterns there." And uh, never darkened the door of a church again, but I wasn't trying to be unkind, but I, the critical spirit. Well, and, I, and, I, and I really put it out there. I said, you know, when people, when God speaks to somebody's heart, it's okay to say, boy, that, that touched me. That spoke to my heart. These folks were touched by the Lord Jesus Christ. They, 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 they couldn't help themselves, if, if I could say it that way. Uh, they had to express that adoration. They had to express that, that gratitude. They had to, they had to praise him. They, they couldn't keep it in. The passage I read from Revelation, I'll tell you what, go home tonight and read it. Revelation 5, 9 to 14, or, or, or 9, uh, yeah, uh, Revelation 5, 9 to 14, and just get a picture of what's going to happen in heaven one day. I mean, uh, when the books are open, amen, and the Lamb opens that book, amen, all of heaven is going to be gathered around the throne. I mean, every angel, every cherubim, every seraphim, I mean, every child of God that's walking on heaven's golden street at that time is going to be praising uh, uh, the God that sits on the throne and the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the earth. I I mean, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to resound through heaven. It, it's going to be a shout like you've never heard. And those folks that are quiet and reserved, uh, they're going to be in a distinct minority at that time because everybody around the throne is going to be praising Almighty God. And I'm arguing for that today. Uh, again, the, I think one of the best days uh, in the history of mankind was Palm Sunday because Jesus Christ was praised and worshipped like he should have been the entire duration of his existence here on earth as a man. 
And, and if that be the case, and I think that that praise, uh, he's worthy of that praise today. He's going to be worthy of that praise tomorrow. He's worthy of that praise as long as we've got breath in our lungs, as long as we've got a mouth to speak and, and a mind to think and a heart to, and a heart to care, then we've got to be expressing that gratitude and that adoration for our Lord Jesus Christ. And if not, then there's a problem somewhere. There's a problem of heart somewhere, maybe a problem of pride somewhere, a problem of sin somewhere that keeps us from offering to God the praise that is rightly due him. So we, we took a look, secondly, at the honor extended to Jesus Christ. Tonight, as we read in our text, um, these words, uh, the Bible says in verse number 41, and when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. Uh, thirdly, tonight, as we consider Palm Sunday, we also need to consider the hurt expressed by Jesus. The Bible says he took a look over Jerusalem. Uh, there's often times when I will go up to the top of uh, uh, Lowry here and make my left on a 30 and go down past uh, 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 right to where uh, Monsoor used to sit. I don't know what they're putting in there. I'm hoping something good. Uh, uh, but I look out and you can look over the city and see a lot of the houses of the city there. Uh, or sometimes when I'm coming down Lowry and I look out and you can see a lot of uh, the city that way or uh, uh, just various different points where you can see large swaths of the city there. Uh, that's exactly what Jesus Christ did is he's going up, the, uh, going up uh, uh, and, and into Jerusalem. He looked over the city. The Bible says he wept over it. He, he was hurt. Why? Because this city he was sent to. These are the people that he was sent to. Some of the, the, uh, the most sad and frustrating verses in the Bible are found in John chapter 1. He came unto his own, but his own received him not. They didn't want him. They didn't care if he was born or not. I mean, when Herod uh, uh, heard from the wise men that the, the king of the Jews was born, uh, he sent to the, the scribes, he sent to the religious leaders, those that should have known, the religious professionals, and they told him where to find him, but they never, went, they never went to step themselves. We're talking three miles. Three miles from the birth of the Messiah, the one that they found in Scripture, that they wouldn't take a step in a holy direction to go and worship him with, the, with these men that have come over 500 miles away who'd seen his sign in the sky. How, uh, how indifferent, how apathetic, how cold, how sinful must a heart be not to care? I mean, to give somebody the information and send them on the way without even caring one iota yourself. And that's the heart of the people that he was sent to. He came on his own, but his own received him not. They had no use for him. They wanted to get him quieted up. They wanted to get him in line, and he wouldn't. Now, let me just say this. Jesus Christ was not a rebel. He was a redeemer. And he was doing the will of God from the heart. He did everything that the Father commanded him to do. So he was not some revolutionary, some dope-smoking, long-haired hippie, amen. He was the son of God. He was doing what God told him to do. He wasn't, again, he wasn't interested in uh, upsetting the establishment. The establishment was rotten from the, from the head down anyway. It was, it, was, it, was not, it was worthless because they were not leading people to Almighty God. They were, they were getting in people's way from seeing God. And so he fought with them for his entire ministry. And so when he gets, to, gets, gets into Jerusalem, he looks over the city, and the Bible says he wept over it. There was a hurt expressed there. And he said this in verse 42, and listen to these words, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, when you worship me, your king coming to you, when you said, Hosanna to the son of David, when you acknowledge me as Savior, when you acknowledge me as a Messiah, in this your day, you, you missed it. You didn't, you didn't get what I came for. He said, the things which belong to thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. And let me just say this. Uh, we, we, we should not be taking the things of God for granted. We should, not be, we should not be messing with the Holy Spirit of God. When he convicts us, we are not to be putting him off. We are not to be ignoring him. We are not to be turning a deaf ear to him or a blind eye to him or a hard heart to him. When he speaks to us, my friend, may we do business and may we do it quickly. Because you know what? There will come a time when, God, when God's Spirit won't strive with us like he does. Why do we have an invitation at the end of, of most every service? Because of, uh, my, my desire is this. My, the, the design on, 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 on it is this way. If God, perchance, has spoken to a heart in this auditorium, I want to give that soul an opportunity to do business with Almighty God, to come down and say, God, I've heard from you, and God, I'm aware of my need, or God, I'm aware of my sin, or God, I'm aware of, of, of this lack in my life, and God, I want, just want to confirm it with you. I want to acknowledge it to you, and God, I'm willing to take the steps to see that through. The altar does not end anything. It begins everything, though. And when we respond to God, that's what the altar's for. That's what the invitation's for. 
Jesus Christ offered them over and over again himself, and they rejected him. And because they rejected him, he said, you know what? Uh, uh, we, we see his, his hurt expressed in, in, in the forsaking of, of, of him and then the foreshadowing of those things to come, really the, the foreshadowing of things to come. He said, for the day shall come upon thee that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side. In A.D. 70, uh, just a little over 30 uh, five years, 36 years from the, the moment he spoke these words, the Roman general Titus would have surrounded Jerusalem. Nobody in, nobody out. It would be filled with worshipers who were there uh, for the high holy days, and the Romans would, would, would encircle the city and, and, and hedge them in the whole way around. Nobody could get out from that point on, and the slaughter began as they began to close the noose around Jerusalem and walked in and just slaughtered everybody in there. If you had a chance to be here when Brother Hiltemiddle was here uh, talking to us about some of the archaeological finds, uh, he did detail that a little bit, how they found the one stone that blocked off the, uh, the, the, the trough, the drain that, uh, that ran from the altar, and how many, bought, how many skeletons they found in there. Uh, nobody escaped uh, the, the Roman noose that was thrown around Jerusalem. And so these words were carried out in just uh, three decades after Jesus Christ spoke them. So we see the hurt expressed by Jesus Christ over the, the foreshadowing of things to come. Not, not only that, if we go through his life a little bit in the Gospels, I just want to give you just a couple here uh, where, his hurt was, where Jesus Christ expressed his hurt. In, in John eleven thirty five, 35, the, the shortest verse in the English Bible, Jesus wept. It's a very easy verse to memorize. I'm working on memorization, and that's my first verse, amen? Jesus wept. But in John eleven thirty five, 35, I've heard sermons. I've heard people say, yeah, Jesus Christ, uh, he was sad. He was not sad at the, at the tomb of Lazarus. He was frustrated. I talked about this this morning at the, in, 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 uh, for, or this afternoon uh, down at Westmoreland Manor. But Jesus Christ was frustrated with them. He just got done telling Martha uh, that he was a resurrection and life, and he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? He said, I'm here. I'm the, I'm the resurrection. I'm going to break up the funeral procession here. I'm going to break up the, the pity party everybody's having. I, I came to glorify God. But Martha, one of his closest earthly friends, didn't believe him. Well, I know my brother will raise it the last day. I can just see Jesus Christ going like this. You missed it. I'm here. I'm the resurrection of life. Lazarus is dead, but he's going to live. And then, then, then Mary says the same thing. Jesus, if you'd been here, our brother had not died. And so he goes to the tomb, he goes to the graveside of Lazarus, and that's where we see Jesus, where, where have you laid him? Jesus wept. Why? Because everybody's standing around crying. They, they didn't have faith to believe that he was going to do what he did end up doing, and that was raising Lazarus from the dead. He had done it before. He could do it again. And he was going to do it again, but they didn't believe him. There was, so there's, the, the hurt was over frustration. Not only did, did Jesus Christ uh, express his hurt uh, at the frustration by the graveside of Lazarus, but in Luke 18, verse 8, Jesus Christ said this. He said, I tell you that, when, uh, that he will avenge him speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. There's frustration there. When I come back, will I find anybody faithful? Because iniquity abounds, the love of many sure will go cold. I mean, we're in a day and age where faith is, is taking a back seat to convenience, and faith is taking a back seat to personal agendas, and faith is taking a back seat to whatever, amen. But it doesn't occupy the place it, it, it used to occupy. And that's sad. I was talking to uh, uh, several pastor friends just recently about that, and, and we were, uh, we were uh, discussing some things along those lines, and... and um, I actually was talking to even Brother, Brother Galley on Wednesday night, and he was asking how things are going here and was telling me a little bit of how things are going for their home church in, in, uh, in, in Maryland there and how things are going down in Chile and things like that. He said, he said Pastor, it just seems to me like, like folks are losing their, losing their grip. They're just kind of holding on very loosely to their faith and not really taking it as seriously as they should. Jesus Christ said, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? Is he going to find anybody that's faithful? Is he going to find anybody that's really sold out? You know what the word fan is short for? Fanatic? You know what a fan fanatic is? Somebody who's got his mind stuck on one subject and won't let it get taken off there. We, need to have, we, don't need to be, we need to be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We will be fanatical followers of Jesus Christ. He is the, he is the, main, the main one. He is a reason for living. He is uh, our, 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 the bishop of our souls. He is our shepherd. He is our God. He is our friend. Uh, uh, he is the one that we take our orders from. There ought to be a devotion there. I'm not saying blind. If you think a Christian's a blind follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you haven't read the Bible. He's not asking us for blind obedience. He's given us plenty of information to follow him and why we ought to. He's given us examples of those that have followed him and found an eternal blessedness. He's given us examples. Examples of those that have rejected him and found eternal frustration. So we've got plenty of evidence to follow with our eyes wide open, our minds fully engaged, and, and our hearts uh, uh, set aflame. 
So the frustration there, uh, uh, Jesus weeping at the grave of Lazarus because they did not believe that he had the power to raise him from the dead. Uh, Jesus Christ uh, uh, expressing hurt uh, that that, uh, there might be very little faith uh, uh, that remains on this earth when he comes again. Uh, How about that that very tragic passage in John 6? Uh, In John 6, verse 66, uh, the Bible says, From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. And then said Jesus unto the twelve, here's Jesus. He said, will you also go away? He expressed his hurt of being forsaken by so many followers. So we see the hurt being expressed by Jesus Christ on this day. It was a very happy day. It was a very joyous day. But you know what? Jesus Christ, uh, with all the praise and adoration coming his way, still uh, had a view of the big picture, still had a view uh, of the eternal consequences of people's choices and how Jerusalem, by and large, would reject him. And because of their rejection, they would suffer a a, a slaughter of untold proportions in just a little bit of time. Why? Because they sinned their day of grace away. They sinned uh, this this divinely appointed, this prophetically... uh, announced meeting uh, between God uh, and, and, and his people in, in Jerusalem at this time. So we see Jesus Christ expressing heart. And then lastly, I want you to look down with me, if you could, in, in our passage in Luke chapter 19, and look with me at verse 45. The Bible says in verse 45, And he went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold therein, and them that bought, saying unto them, It is written, My house is the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. He taught daily in the temple, but the chief priests and scribes and the chief of the people sought to destroy him. A den of thieves was pretty right. It wasn't just the money changes. It wasn't just the merchandisers in there. It was a religious crowd in there, too, that were the thieves trying to steal the souls of the people away from God, to whom they rightly should have belonged. So what do we see here? We see the holiness expected by Jesus. He expected his place to be holy. Can I say this? Not only expect that place to be holy, he expects his people to be holy. He expects us to be holy. You, you will find very few preachers on TV that ever preach for holiness. They will preach a health and wealth, prosperity type gospel. They will, they will, uh, they will come across like uh, snake oil salesmen. They will, they, they will come across like carnival barkers for, for side shows and things like that. But rarely will you find a preacher on TV that preaches for holiness because holiness doesn't sell. Holiness is not something that people say, give me another sermon on holiness, Pastor Ross. Tell me, tell, tell me uh, I need to be holy. No, we'd rather be told how to be happy. We'd rather be told how to be blessed or uh, the, anything but holiness. Because holiness runs contrary to the spirit that's inside of us as far as the flesh goes. Flesh does not want to be holy. It never will want to be holy. It will not allow uh, holiness to take place without a dogfight going on daily. And even if you win it today, you still got to fight it tomorrow. So it's a grind. It's, it's a battle. It's a marathon. Amen. It's, it's, it's a long haul. And guess what? Holiness is worth it, though. And he expected holiness. He said, you know what, this place was designed not for you guys to make a quick buck on, on selling animals here for sacrifices, not for you to make a quick buck on, on your money changing or, or, or exchanging of currencies in here or, or, or selling of this or that. He said, that was not the reason this place was made. This is supposed to be a house of prayer. It's got a unique purpose, and it wasn't for selling. It wasn't for buying. It wasn't for merchandising, and you've turned it into a den of thieves, and it's supposed to be a house of prayer. He said, this is supposed to be a special place. It's supposed to be a holy place. It's supposed to be a dedicated place. It's supposed to be a set apart place Uh, it's for my use and not for your own and 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 can i say this Uh, the the temple was a very special place to them it was a very cherished place to them but even more important than that place can i say this my friends uh the temple is no longer uh, in existence for us it's no longer in existence it will be rebuilt one day but it isn't right now where 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 is the temple right now that god's concerned with right miss ellen our bodies if he expected the, the temple in Jerusalem to be treated with respect and be regarded and kept as holy, can I say, my friends, then your body and my body ought to, be review, ought to be regarded as holy objects to God, special. They ought to be kept separate and set apart and different and distinct from the junk that's going on in this world. And every time we yield, we defile uh, something that God says, I want to be holy. 
In Matthew, we see the, the account uh, uh, that Matthew gives of this, uh, this event, uh, uh, the holiness expected by Jesus Christ. He went into the temple in Matthew 21, 12. Uh, Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have met it a den of thieves. In John, he gives us uh, uh, this account. And when he had made a scourge of small cords. What do you make that scourge of small cords for? He just wanted to have something to wear on his hip. No, he was doing business, amen. These folks who think Jesus Christ was some kind of pacifist, uh, you know, some Nancy boy pacifist, do not know who Jesus Christ was. Have no clue. He went in there with a the scourge of cords. He was not going in there to play patty cake with these folks. Uh, when he threw the tables over, he didn't go over and say, uh, excuse me, sir. Uh, do you mind? That's the kind of passion Christ had. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. I mean, he wasn't worried about where the table landed, where the money went. He wasn't worried about where the, uh, uh, the thieves in that house scurried to. He just was uh, uh, trying to create an indelible impression that they were messing with holy things. He was willing to go in there with the scourge of small cords and drove them all, drove them. He didn't invite them to leave. He forced them out, drove them, amen, like a, like a butcher would drive uh, 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 hogs or, or, or ca cattle to the slaughter. I mean, they don't do it very gently. They don't go, come on, Bessie, let's go get, your, let's go get killed now. Uh, come on, little piggy, uh, uh, let's go. The butcher wants to meet you right now. Uh, they, they don't just pat them along and, and, and you know, encourage them along. They, 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 they whoop them along. Jesus Christ drove them from the temple, uh, and, 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 and again, uh, those that sold sheep and oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things, hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. What was eaten up with the zeal, but that holiness, that desire to keep the, the things of God holy and respectable and sacred and set apart. And can I say this? This building that we're in tonight is not a sacred building except for its purpose, except for the designation that the children of God meet here, that the praises of God are sung here, that the prayers of God, uh, the prayers to God are offered up here, and that the word of God is preached here. But I'll tell you what, there's nothing sacred about the, uh, about the drywall that was used or the, the steel that was used to fabricate this place. It is a sacred place because it's been set apart for a very special purpose. The children of God meet together here at Heritage and consider the things of God here uh, on, a, on a regular, weekly basis. And it's holy for that reason, uh, not because God dwells here, but because the children of God meet here. And so Jesus Christ wanted to set them apart. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. And they were referencing Psalm 69, verse 9, where the, where the psalmist said, For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. Can I say this tonight as I, as I finish out tonight? We need to get back to holiness. We have been under assault. There's a tidal wave of just filth and, and, and just things that are displeasing to God washing over our country. And we can sit and point our fingers at the, uh, at the transvestites. We can point, our, we can point our, our fingers at the transgenders. We can point our fingers at the homosexuals. We can point our fingers at the prostitutes and the pimps. We can point our fingers at the drug dealers. We can point our fingers at the lying politicians. We can point our fingers at the, at the, uh, 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 the folks that have designs on ruining our country. We can point them every direction. But I'll tell you what, we need to stop pointing our fingers outward and start pointing them back inward and say, you know what, the problem is not them. The problem is me. Because I'm not holy like I need to be holy. I'm not set apart like I need to be set apart. I, I, I'm giving in too much. I'm yielding to temptation far too often. I, I'm indulging my flesh uh, way, way, way too much. Amen. I'm using the word I on purpose, amen. You've got to make your own call there, amen. You might be happy with the way things are, but you might want to check in with God every once in a while and find out how you're doing, big boy. Because I'll tell you what, we need some more holiness, amen? Why? Our, our, our salt has gotten less salty. Our light has grown dim. And let me just say this. This world is getting darker by the moment. And, and, and the things of God are getting duller uh, uh, to the people of God uh, 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 more and more. And I'll tell you what, it's not the problem of the world. It's a problem in the church. We've lost our sight of holiness. We've lost our desire to be holy. We've lost our fear of God. What do you mean fear of God? I mean a respect for God, a reverence for God, a, 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 a desire to, to please God. The Bible says in Leviticus uh, chapter 20, verse 7, uh, Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. Why should I be holy? Because God's God. And he said so. I don't have a right to debate that. He's God, I'm not. He said be holy. 
Why? Because I want. Because I said so. He doesn't need to explain it, but he, he goes on and does. And guess what? Guess who he puts the sanctification on? It's a process that he wants to work out, but he says, sanctify yourselves. I will tell you what I want you to be. I will give you a path to it. But you know what? You've got to get on the path. You've got to walk forward in that. You've got to stop fighting my Holy Spirit and sanctify yourself. He puts, it on, he puts the pressure. He puts the responsibility on me. If I'm not sanctified, it's not God's fault. If I'm not sanctified, it's not my wife's fault. It's not my kid's fault. It's not my church's fault. It's not my preacher's fault. It's nobody's fault but my own. If I'm not sanctified, if I'm living below my calling as a child of God, it's nobody's fault but mine. We like to blame everybody and anybody, but you know what? When it gets down to it, the problem is the problem is the one we look at in the mirror. Sanctify yourselves, God says to his people in the biggest 27. Uh, in 1 Peter 1, 15, listen to these words. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. In all man- God, God expects holiness in every aspect of our life. The choices we make, the, the path we're on, the, the things we do, the attitudes we carry, God expects a holiness there in those things. He said, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. It's an expectation of God. It's a command of God. It's a desire of God to be exercised in his children. Jesus said this in Matthew 5, 48, and we might want to pay attention to him if we're, we're claiming to be his followers. He said, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. What's that word perfect mean? Sinless? No, it means complete. It means mature, and part of maturity in the Christian life is being holy. It's part and parcel of who we're supposed to be. The Bible, the writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 12, 14, Follow peace with all men and holiness, get this, without which no man shall see the Lord. You know why we have such a hard time discerning the will of God? And why we have such a hard time seeing how God is at work or, or even if God is at work? Because we're not following holiness. And the Bible says if we're not going to follow holiness, we're not going to see God. We're not going to perceive God. We're not going to be able to, to, to determine how God is working in our lives. And spiritual blindness is a very scary state. And then lastly, this uh, from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Here it is, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Jesus Christ was willing to turn over some tables and, and cast out the money changers and dry them out and, and set things right and declare plainly that the temple was his turf. But how much more should he be able to lay claim to our bodies and to our spirit, which are his? We've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your soul and your spirit with everything that we have, every aspect of our being, we ought to be holy. What are we seeing today on this day of Palm Sunday? We've seen the humility embodied by Jesus Christ. We've seen the honor extended to Jesus. We've seen the uh, hurt expressed by Jesus. And we've seen the holiness expected by Jesus. I hope that uh, we won't leave Palm Sunday behind. I, I think we ought to be praising him. I think we ought to be rejoicing in what a wonderful Savior we have and what a, what a great salvation he's, he's, he's uh, 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 purchased for us. I, I believe that. I believe we ought to do a better job praising him. I think we ought to consider how the actions of his people can hurt him because we can grieve the Holy Spirit of God. But I also think we ought to really live up to that holiness that God expects of us because we're his children and he's holy and because he's holy, we ought to be holy as well.